I'd like to tell you a little bit about the history of adult Russian disease. As always in a type of talk of this kind, I can only highlight a few individuals out of the hundreds that have actually worked on a disorder. And science has to got to be looked as a collaborative endeavour and that we shouldn't give individuals too much prominence as it's all a collaboration and that's how we make progress. So Refson's disease was originally described in 1945 by Sigiswald Refson, a fisherman and later office worker who presented with progressive visual loss, was found to have retinitis pigmentosa, was deaf, had no sense of smell or taste, had short fingers or toes, had weakness, sort of glutton stocking distribution, and also had a weakness syndrome in his muscles and staggered from place to place, metaxia. And he described this cluster of symptoms as uh, heredopathia atactica polyneuritiformis in Latin, and it rapidly became known as Refson disease. Um, and that is a name that it still has to this day. It is interesting that this patient was later reanalyzed by Morton Horn and the Oslo group, um, uh, as he originally came, I think, from Tromsø, uh, and found to have one of the subgroups of Refson's disease. So this can be counted as a somewhat fortuitous presentation, but nevertheless spiked a lot of interest and started the whole process of, adult, of identifying and treating, diagnosing and treating Refson's disease. The next uh, advance came coincidentally from the Milk Marketing Board in New Zealand who were in conducting analysis of sheep's milk and found some strange phytanic acids. One of which was this branched chain uh, uh, fatty acid called phytanic acid. This was not linked to another to a human disease until 1963, when a patient in Germany had analysis of their blood performed by Ken Ken Kalka, who found that there was an abnormally high level of a strange fatty acid on their chromatograph and they identified it as phytanic acid, indicating that this was said that this was likely to be accumulating and possibly causative for Refson's disease. Now, the next work that was done on this was to identify how this might occur. In parallel, people had been working on cell compartments, though they knew that there were batteries in cells called mitochondria, and these had been the subject of study from the early 50s. In the 60s and 70s, it was noticed that there were other compartments. And one of the compartments that was found was the peroxone, which uh, was a strange compartment full of catalase and oxygen, which is very unusual inside cells as oxygen is very toxic. It's an incredibly ancient, present in plants, fungi and animals. It seemed to have multiple functions. It seemed to be involved in degrading fatty acids, either by taking two carbon units off them, beta oxidation, or one carbon unit off them, alpha oxidation. It was involved in making long chain fatty acids. It was involved in making cholesterol. It was involved in degrading nucleotides from DNA. And also in many animals involved in, in either synthesizing or degrading vitamins. Now, peroxisome metabolism, because it was interested in fats and cholesterol, despite the interest of many people as to what possible relation this may have. And Dan Steinberg, who was then at the NIH, and later at UCLA, discovered that alpha oxidation, this one carbon pathway, actually involved the metabolism of phytanic acid. This work on the peroxone metabolism and the alpha oxidation pathway and how phytanic acid is degraded, then produced a lot of work done uh, by Hugo and Moser at the Kennedy Krieger Center, and then uh, Ron Vanders, the Amsterdam Peroxisome Group and Laboratory of Peroxisome and Inherited Disease in Amsterdam, who have done a lot to clarify the pathway over the years. Ron has also worked on the other side of phytanic acid metabolism and of uh, metabolism of complex fatty acids, which is the omega oxidation pathway. Um, we know that alpha oxidation doesn't work in Refson disease, but that we knew that there was an alternative pathway that degraded phytanic acid. And this produced uh, some urine metabolites called tumor methyladipic acid, 
and this was postulated to come through phyt uh, from phytanic acid by omega oxidation. And Ron helped clarify the pathway by which this occurred, including the cytochrome enzyme that starts the process of omega oxidation by creating a new acid group, making a double acid with an acid group on either end, and then progressive shortening from the newly added acid group to produce all the, the successive successor compounds. He has also worked on the pathway of phytol metabolism. Now, phytol is what is originally cleaved off the chlorophyll molecule by bacteria. And for many years, it has been debated whether it is toxic in man or not. If humans can metabolize phytol up to phytanic acid, then it is potentially toxic. And Ron was one of the first was one of the people to recently identify the pathways by which phytol can be converted to phytonyl CoA. Though the question of the toxicity of phytol still remains open. Though we had a pathway, we had a defect that was identified in cell subcomponent structures. We didn't have a purified enzyme, and we didn't know what it looked like. And Going back to the Norwegian group and to uh, Ole Skeldal uh, and Stocker and Morten Horn, uh, Ron collaborated with the Oslo group in taking five patients with Refson's disease who had been seen either in Holland or in Norway and identified a new enzyme. This enzyme was phytonyl coa hydroxylase. It was located in the peroxisome. It had changes that were found in patients that had Refson's disease. And actually, when you actually looked at the activity of the peroxisomes from those patients, alpha oxidation was deficient. So this was enough to prove that there, the cause of at least some of the cases of Refson's disease was a defect in Phi H. And this is the first of the Refson's disease syndrome. The next stage was to actually work out what these mutations and changes were doing. And this was done as part of the later collaboration through the EU funded RTP grant, which all of us, including the University of Nor of Oslo, uh, Chelsea Westminster Hospital, uh, Ron and the Amsterdam group, the University of Leuven, with particular interest in, uh, in the lyase enzyme, second step in the pathway, and in and mouse models of proxomal disease contributed. Now the Oxford group was interested, has been long interested in the synthesis of terpenes and sesquiterpenes and actually antibiotics. And these involve enzymes called dioxygenases or oxygenases. And Chris Schofield and Matthew Lloyd, um, in one of those tea time conversations that happened fortuitously, uh, and my actually looked at this and thought, hang on, this might be quite interesting. This might find possibly Phi H's and oxidase. And we did sequence homology structures, looked at comparing sequences between animals and different functions, and it looked a very promising candidate. That gave us a mechanism. It gave us a mechanism that involved a binding site for the fatty acid. In actual fact, it involves a carrier protein called stereocarrier protein. It involved a donor for making intermediates, and that's 2-ketoglutarate. And this binds to an HXD motif, which is characteristic of oxygenase enzymes, because it has an active iron site. And we were able, and Chris and his collaborators and Matthew were able to crystallize the enzyme, come up with the structure, show it was the beta barrel, that is uh, seven strand beta barrel, that is characteristic of these enzymes. And also to show that many of those mutations identified by Ron and uh, Skeldal and others uh, groups were actually present in the, this particular enzyme. And they see many of them seem to affect this intermediate binding site. We also were able to sort of look at how this, the changes in the size, shape and size of that binding site could be manipulated and whether we could put something else in there which just happened to have an oxygen at the right place, because there's the two keto oxygen that's key. And shorter compounds, longer compounds would go in. Unfortunately, because this is all compartmentalized off, giving them as external supplements doesn't work. It's a beautiful bit of chemistry to show theoret theoretical rescue, but actually it's proved of that we couldn't 
something that couldn't translate it into something that could be used on a wider scale. I also, in my clinical role, uh, had an interest in uh, had an interest in genetics. Looked at the cases that the 25 odd cases that we'd accumulated at Chelsea Westminster of people with adult recencies. And the first thing we did to look at was gather all the families together and see whether they all mapped to the chromosome 10 locus identified by Rob. Actually, we found two that didn't. And those people turned out to lack to chromosome 7. A quick look through the databases suggested that there was a proximal enzyme there called peroxin 7, but it wasn't an enzyme. It was a complex part of a complex transporter, which involves trans moving proteins with a particular signaling sequence rotated at the front end and then into the peroxisome. And looking at Phi H, it had that PTS2 signal and a signal peptide, exactly as we'd expect. And when we actually sequenced the patients and did expression studies through ROMS lab, there were defects as that. So that meant that the second cause of reference disease was actually a subgroup of a different disorder. That different disorder was rhizomelic chondrodysplasia, which is actually causes far more severe symptom because it also affects plasmalogens and other enzymes brought into the, uh, by the PEC7 transporter. Whereas in the Russian variant, only the transport of Phi H seemed to be affected. Though when we looked very subtle, there were very subtle changes in plasmalogens, but not enough to cause any significant clinical symptoms. So that gave us the second cause of Russian's disease. So not only did we have defects in the enzyme, we now had defects in the import of the enzyme into the peroxisome. The third form of Russian's disease was also done in Ron's lab, starting with a collaboration with Brendan McLean, who's a neurologist in Cornwall, but who I had known at the Institute of Neurology in Queen's Square in London, who found a patient with a neuropathy, a bile acid defect, and with retinitis pigmentosa. He sent those samples off to Ron's lab, and Sasha Fernandes in that lab identified that there was a defect. It wasn't in Phi H. It wasn't in the next enzyme down, but it was at the end of the pathway in an enzyme called alpha-methyl, alpha-acyl-CoA uh, racinase, which actually explained one of the bits, peculiar bits of biochemistry of the pathway, which is that it didn't have a handedness. This is the enzyme that switched the left-handed and right-handed forms intermediately, and all the lower steps subsequently after that are the standard right-handedness that we find in all biological symptom systems. So Sasha identified AMACR and found that in some cases of AMR deficiency, though the principal rise is in pristanic acid, there is a secondary rise in phytanic acid, and some of them overlap reference disease in how they present clinically. Now this isn't, hasn't been the end of the story. We've known for a little while that there are other conditions that can give rise to the constellation of symptoms that look like references. Some of the Usher syndromes, which are ciliopathies associated with deafness syndromes, give rise to a refson like syndrome of deafness and retinitis pigmentosa with kidney defects on occasions as well. But then, then what was quite surprising was that there was a case that looked very much like Refson's disease, again found in Norway by Thomas Fiskenstrand, which showed cataracts, showed retinitis pigmentosa, showed joint abnormalities, showed a leukodystrophy, but it was nothing to do with any of these. It turned out to be a defect in 2 arachidonal glycerol, uh, an, an enzyme involved in endem cannabinoid metabolism that gives rise to a refson like syndrome. Now, we already know that, that uh, in Sjogren Larsen syndrome, another aldehyde dehydrogenase gives rise to a rise in phytanic acid. But this, we don't see that the two conditions are related. And we're still completely unsure as to why you should get a Refson phenocopy, a copy of Refson disease syndrome in PHARC. There's something here we don't understand, or something convergent in a pathway we don't know about. Now, a lot of the work in Refson's disease has been done at the Westminster Hospital. This is the National Referral Centre in the UK, and we've seen pretty much all, all the patients with Refson's disease in the UK, of which we think there are about 46. We've also seen referrals from Europe and from other countries now that we can use video technology. And all of this work is done by 
Dr. Brian Gibbard, the chief neurologist at the hospital. And there's a picture of the old Westminster Hospital above. It's now a rather expensive uh, apartments behind the Houses of Parliament. And in 1979, Brian Gibbard was presented with a brother and sister with Refson's disease who came in acutely unwell. He described and that spiked his interest and he worked with John Meliboria, who was the then head of the laboratory of chemistry at the Westminster Hospital, to actually identify these people. So they diagnosed them with Refson's disease based on the work that had been done by Ken Kalka, um, uh, and, uh, and Hugo and Ann Moser, as well um, as others. And also, so they came and came up with a treatment. They took on the work of Lundstrom, who shown that because this, fat, this fatty acid was small, you could take it out with plasmapheresis. Uh, Ola Skeldahl and uh, Dan Steinberg had shown that plasmapheresis was feasible in Refsum's disease uh, in, in the US and in Norway, and Brian applied it to cases in the UK. He also sort of noticed that, this, that they, we could probably do better if we actually took the toxin out of the diet and so therefore he came up with the idea of combining plasmapheresis with dietary intervention as a long-term management strategy for Refsum's disease. In amongst all of this, he was referred more and more patients because he was known to have an interest in this. And he described the eye science, the sign, the hearing signs, the different types of bone defects, different types of nerve changes, skin changes, smell changes. And we even looked at the heart changes when acute Refsum's disease and chronic diet-treated Refsum's disease showing that all the arrhythmias disease resolve, though we've never quite got around to publishing that. Brian also did a lot, has done a lot of the work on coming up with a new diet and working up plasmapheresis protocols when we needed them. And he was one of the key people involved in the great collaboration that the EU funded to actually clarify the Refsum's disease from 1992 onwards. So Brian's original work was the combined diet and plasmapheresis approach in 1979. And this is the first dietary analysis in man, showing that uh, we you can even analyze chicken curry in those days. Um, and that one, and he actually showed these levels of extraction and that the patient got better when you did a very large scale plasma exchange, that's five liters. These days, we probably wouldn't do more than about 2.5 or three. And there was successive, and he did this successively. And then eventually they decided that actually recurrent plasmapheresis wasn't going to be the long-term treatment, but we needed something a little bit more acceptable. And then we decided that actually we should work a little bit more on the diet. And with June Brown, uh, Um, David Burston, Maggie Hancock, and lately as a new uh, intern, a new resident, as a new junior doctor, myself, uh, we uh, did some of the analyses that came up with the Refson diet, version two of it happens. And this is the one that is familiar to patients. This is the one that says to avoid dairy foods, to avoid beef, to avoid mutton, to comes up with the um, that are low alternative the alternatives, and this has been the basis of the diet ever since. It's only this year, with the support of the Dare Foundation, that we've got round to reanalyzing a lot of those foods to see what has actually changed in 30 years. Now, the long, what did long-term dietary therapy do? Eleanor Baldwin um, took over from uh, Margaret Seide. Uh, as uh, our chief dietetic advisor uh, for Refson's disease. And she has done a lot of work on Refson's disease, looking at the long-term consequences. And this is some of the data that we had over 15 years of treatment, showing that if we start with patients with 100% original phytanic acid levels, this was somewhere usually in the range of between 1,000 and 3,000 micromoles per litre, uh, i.e. Uh, 50 to 200 times normal, that if you treated people with diet, their phytanic acid levels progressively fell in plasma 
they, they did get spikes caused by infections and uh, admissions, but those spikes got less severe and less frequent with time. And that has been the basis of showing that long-term dietary therapy actually works. Helena has also done a lot of work around the dietary adequacy of this because we are restricting fat and soluble components in the diet and therefore it might be suggested that we would actually change and result in secondary vitamin deficiencies and we managed to analyze the fat soluble vitamins and found that vitamin d deficiency actually does occur a little bit more frequently in reference disease with diets we are now measuring these uh, vitamins on long-term treatment just to supplement where necessary and are beginning to look at whether we should supplement uh, essential fatty acids or not and also a little quirk that came out is that a lot of the foods that were safe like pork and pork products turned out to be rich in salt so we actually need to induce a little bit of salt restriction just for general health purposes now that was in humans but could we actually find a treatment a drug a different approach and the key to that was actually in part of the RDPPT project which was Miriam Bass working in uh, Leuven along with uh, a group that were interested in um, HCA lyase, the second enzyme in the pathway. And as part of Miriam Bass and with Ron, they came up with a mouse that was deficient in Phi H. So we had a Refsen disease mouse model, and this has been characterized. Unfortunately, mice don't get the eye changes, they don't get the hearing changes, but they do get the neurological symptoms and the weakness if you feed them phytanic acid. And one of the things that we did was to look for what could actually induce omega oxidation. I'd shown from work that I'd done at Chelsea Westminster that uh, patients who uh, were came in and were, did not eat for 48 hours did actually switch on their omega oxidation pathway. It wasn't enough to stop their phytanic acid rising, but that pathway was switched on. So if we knew that the pathway existed, then what else could switch it on? And in mouse models, we ident Ron identified that the prowess was cytochrome P450. These are typically enzymes that re respond or are involved in metabolizing drugs or toxins, and phytanic acid is a toxin. So this is a cytochrome 4F series. And in mice, a particular drug that we already used in humans called phenofibrate, a drug reduced to use blood fat or triglyceride levels, was effective. Unfortunately, when you actually look at human proxosomes compared to mouse proxosomes, in human proxosomes, you don't see the same changes. So this therapy works in mice, but doesn't seem to work in man. Um, we need to look in a little bit more detail, as possibly we're missing something, and possibly another compound that activates the cytochrome 4, 4 series may actually work in man rather than in mice, and that still remains an active area of research. So overall, we've made a lot of progress in the last 70 years in residencies, from its clinical description to dietary and interventional treatment to constant combined management and a tolerable diet for Refson disease. We've actually defined the defects in the structure, and for this, we have to be very thankful to the support of the European Union, which supported us through the FP7 collaboration between Amsterdam, Chelsea Westminster, Imperial, Oxford, Leuven and Oslo. And we've done, identified the pathway, the backup pathways, the signalling systems that actually drive import of the enzyme. We've identified that there's more than one cause for Refson's disease. We've identified that there seems to be a convergent series uh, of defects that don't seem to involve proxome metabolism, but nevertheless cause out the same kind of end symptoms. And what the link is, we don't know. But what we have got is the basis of an understanding. And with that basis of understanding, we can look at improved therapies. We might be able to repurpose a drug. We're still working on that. We know that Refson's disease involves the acute release of phytanic acid from the liver in response to environmental stress. And if we do gene therapy to the liver, we can probably manage to rescue that defect, therefore blunting the acute damaging effects of phytanic acid. Whether we can give uh, the phi H back into the eye and resolve 
ID changes remains to be seen because we really don't know where the defect is in the eye cells. Is it in the receptors? Is it in the recycling of the photoreceptor system? We don't know. So there's a lot still to do, but a lot has been done. And I think the outlook for Russian disease is that it is a very promising area for future treatment.